we notice that the crucifixion in Mark's gospel is quite different than it is especially in Luke and John because of the sheer starkness of the way in which Jesus dies with no kind of final words of forgiveness or farewell or trust, but just, right. my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One reason that the gospel of Mark has puzzled lots of people is that the resurrection also seems to end, the resurrection story, chapter 16, seems to end oddly. What's going on there? Yeah, it's, we get an empty tomb, but nobody to tell about it. Hmm. And so 16, 8, the last words of the gospel are, uh, the woman went away and didn't tell anybody because they were afraid, yeah. right? So everything toward which this gospel has been building, including the climax of the, of the cross, uh, ends up resting on how these people are going to respond to this resurrection and nobody's going to hear about it at least at the end of 8, uh, 16 8. It, it's the great great puzzle it's what keeps you and me reading Absolutely, right? It's, right it's the great puzzle of Mark's gospel and everybody's tried to help him right um, copyists tried to help him yep. and put a little more on the end so that it would be a little more like Matthew or more like Luke so, or more like so John. just the endings I'm being older than you, grew up with the King James Bible. Right. And King James Bible did not end with chapter 16, verse 8. It ended with chapter 16, verse 20. Right. And he appears several times, and he deals with Mary Magdalene and does many wonderful things. But you're saying that's not the earlier copy, right? Right. And it's, it's consensus, as close as you get to consensus yeah. among scholars, that 16.8 would have been the ending because it's, it's the most represented in the manuscripts and also because it... It, uh, it makes the least sense, yeah. which means copyists seem to be trying to help it out elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what that leaves us with, having lived 16 chapters or 15 prior chapters, right. is a lot of unfinished business that when we get to the end of 16.8, if we're in an audience listening to this, feels like it's not yet done. Yeah. Part of that is because we come to it having heard other gospels, right? So, of course. So yeah. Jesus isn't going to make breakfast yeah. on the beach yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah. isn't yeah. going to go to Mary a mass here. And I know she's supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we, um, we partly get our expectations elsewhere, but there are plenty in Mark's gospel to have us thinking, is this really over yeah. at the end? Because back in chapter 1, a, a little thing, back in chapter 1, John the Baptist announced Jesus by saying one is coming after me who's mightier than I am, and that one will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We haven't seen any we have of that. that right. Right? We haven't yeah. seen any of yeah. that. Yeah. And throughout the gospel, we have the expectation that at some point, some disciple is going to get what the narrator in 1-1 and God at the baptism and at the transfiguration and the demons and then Jesus at his own trial all know, which is, and then finally the centurion all know, yeah. which is that this is the Son of God and none of them in the course of 16 chapters have yet gotten it. Yeah. We also expected that they would somehow come back around to understanding that this uh, denying of self that Jesus called for at Caesarea Philippi to, to Peter, this uh, take up your cross and yeah. follow me, um, let him deny himself, um, that this will somehow sink in sometime, and it hasn't. Yeah. Through three passing predictions, they just keep not getting it. Yeah. And so by the, by the end of this, and, and you reminded me earlier in this, uh, this afternoon that in the transfiguration we hear, they won't get this until after the resurrection, right? right. Well, there's nobody there to get right. it after so the it resurrection right. yeah, yeah, yeah. in 168. So, yeah. so there's a whole, there are a whole lot of loops that haven't been closed oh. in the world of the gospel, not just in our expectations because we know more than this gospel, yeah. um, in the world of the gospel at the end of 168. And I think that's Mark's uh, sort of clever way of doing something that you brought up a long time ago in these in these conversations, which is uh, saying this is the beginning of the gospel mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because if I'm in if I'm in a room listening to this, and I have come in as we talked about earlier, saying I'm going to watch those disciples right. because those disciples are my key to what right. I need to do. Right. Right. And you know if if uh, Papius is right. This is happening in Rome, and we may be in post-Nero times, yeah. right? But it doesn't need to be that. We see in chapter 13 they're expecting persecutions and maybe experiencing them. What they need is courageous disciples, yeah. and so they listen the whole time to see 
what they're supposed to look like, and they don't get it. At the end of the gospel, they still haven't yeah. got it. And so I imagine this silence in the room afterwards, this sort of disappointed, almost angry silence, in which they are looking for how, yeah. how are we going to, where are we going to hang our hat? Yeah. And then someone remembers, wait a second, we know Peter went on mm -hmm. to do... Uh, to do martyrdom, yeah. right? And yeah. we, know, we know these guys, and the stories start to fly. Yeah. Um, we know these guys eventually got this it. This is not the end of the... This it's is not the end, the end of the... This is the end of the written story. It's not the end of the gospel. It's the end of the beginning. It's the end of the beginning. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so that moment of recognition asks, uh, raises the next question, which is how. How did they change from yeah. these sniveling guys yeah. that we see running away at every chance yeah. to to the courageous ones yeah. who we know about from from stories around campfires yeah. and yeah. and and in that moment they are I think driven to realize that whether the women run and ran away afraid from the tomb or not somehow Jesus found these guys mm -hmm. and they experienced the risen. Christ. They got what Holy Spirit baptism. They understood at some point what uh, this downward direction of discipleship looked like, and mm -hmm. because otherwise we don't end up with the the apostles that they knew. Yeah, 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 yeah. From the disciples' yeah. raw material. Yeah, does that yeah. make sense? It does make sense. Uh, I. It makes sense. Doesn't mean I'm happy with the solution to the puzzle entirely, because right. it still puzzles me. Right. The the most recent kind of illustration I've had in my own reading that helps a little bit, and it's it's reverse in terms of being further tragedy, not greater triumph at the end of the story. But I've been reading Wolf Hall, which is the new retelling of the Anne Boleyn Henry VIII story through the eyes of Thomas Cromwell. And it ends with uh, Anne Boleyn still alive, well, and as happy as one can be with Henry VIII as a husband, which is not very happy, as a matter <laughs> of fact. But we know what the story won't... In the story world, that's the end of the story. We, living in a world beyond, know that she's the next to go. And that, that Henry VIII, who's wandering off to see Jane Seymour that weekend, will choose Jane as the next lucky recipient of his affections. And the novel is richer because we know a history beyond the novel. Right. I think in some ways the Gospel of Mark is richer because we know that the end of that story told is not the end of the story lived. Right. That, that this is a transition from the way the story begins to the way the story goes on. I've also always often long suspected, recently suspected, that the silence of the women is not only contrasted with what must happen to them and to the disciples later, it's contrasted with us. Mm -hmm. We tell. All right, you guys go tell, right? Right, right. right. If, if, if we were left to the silent first generation, we might not make it. But now we, in 70 AD, 68 AD, whatever it is, yeah. We're in the business of telling this story. We're, we're not invited to silence. And 2010 AD, right? And 2010, yeah. we're yeah, not yeah. invited to silence. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we've, we've marked along the way, uh, we've noted along the way Mark's cleverness and, and how much we uh, see him arraying things so that messages come from more than just individual unit yeah, yeah. of, of, yeah. Uh, of a yeah. paragraph. Yeah. And we, uh, we therefore can look back and ask, are there hints? We saw side-by-side side two synagogue healings and we compared them. We saw side-by-side side two uh, bread miracles and we compared them and Mark seemed to want us to compare them. Right. Uh, I don't know. This, this is sort of, I don't know whether this is advanced placement listening for an early Christian crowd or for a contemporary crowd, whether it's, it's making Mark over clever. But in, in chapter 8, just before the scene at Caesarea Philippi, yeah. You get this very strange episode that the other Gospels don't want to repeat <laughs> uh, in which Jesus heals a man of his blindness yeah. in two stages. Right. Right. And uh, if, if we sit with Mark long enough, we realize that we, when something weird happens, we ought to watch it and see if there's messages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a first stage in which Jesus uh, puts mud on the guy's eye and asks, can you see? And the guy says, I can see, but it's like, trees walking around, right. right? People are like trees walking right. around. And then he cleanses his eyes and he can see fully. Yep. Uh, that comes just before Jesus uh, and, and Peter at Caesarea Philippi where, where Peter says, you're the Messiah, yeah. and essentially Jesus quietly says, you're right. And then... Uh, but not right enough. And, and then Jesus says, I'm going to die, yeah. and yeah. Peter says, yeah. no. Yeah. So Peter's wrong. Peter's so got... He, 
half vision. He sees yeah. he sees people like trees walking yeah. along, yeah. which which means that it's another one of these bits that tries to set an expectation yeah. that isn't realized in the pages yeah. of, of yeah. the Gospel through yeah. sixteen eight. If that's the case, and again, who knows if that gets tracked when I get to sixteen eight and I'm in an ancient I know. Uh, listening yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do I look back and say, yeah. "Aha, yeah. that's that's I what know. was happening in eight. But for those of us who get the luxury of going back yeah. and looking at it over and over and, and reading it, that's awfully nice. Yeah, it, it signals something that gives hope that sixteen eight isn't the last word, which we know yeah. by the end. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, the other, the other thing that does that for me, and I, I just confess, I've stopped worrying as much about what the first century heard than I used to, uh -huh. because it's unanswerable. Uh -huh. I just uh, among the things I'll never know are what did a first century audience hear when they hear that. That gives me total liberty to say, now that I've seen it, it must be there, right? Yeah, so right. now that I've seen this, this must be there, right. and if they missed it, alas for them. Yeah. But um, how often the theme of fear comes up in this gospel. Mm -hmm. Right. And the very last thing that happens with these women yeah. in Mark 16 is they're afraid. Right. Uh, the next to the last word is afraid. Right. And the last word is because, which is almost mid-sentence, not yeah. even, yeah, yeah. not just mid-thought, but mid-sentence. Uh, time and again, Jesus contrasts faith with fear and says, don't be fearful, only have faith. And the one I remember most clearly is when he's walking across the sea and they're terrified. And just when they're most afraid, he joins them in the boat and comforts them. And my strong suspicion for a long time has been that if we read Mark's gospel through seeing that fear is always contrasted with faith and comes just before promise, that we know fear can't be the last word now either. Right. That there's that next word which lies beyond the words on the page, and that has to do with faith and comfort and reappearance. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and now you're too, I mean, at the beginning of these uh, sessions, you asked me, why do I keep reading this gospel? Yeah. And I gave an answer about how quickly things come at us, and, and that's part of it. And I gave an answer about how quickly Jesus starts to reveal who he is through actions instead of words, and that's part of it. But when you get to the end of the day, what this gospel does is it lays out the possibility that God can help us amidst those myriad fears we have, that, that, that God never lets fear be the last right. word. And it's true on the cross. Right. Right? And it's true, it's true in, the in, the, in the resurrection. too. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so at the end of the day, the, the answer deepens to why should we keep reading this book? Why, yeah. why is it helpful for the church? There's a profound message of help. There's a profound message that the things that seem final and thwarting are not so. That's, that's a good reason. I think you can't get better news than that. Let's stop. <laughs>